Chrissy, thank you very much indeed for the kind introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here today on behalf of Casia. Uh, obviously, we're a listed company, so the usual disclaimers apply to everything I say here today. So to give you a broad picture of our company to start with, we are a pure oncology-focused biotech company. We do nothing but the development of new therapies for cancer. And at the moment, we have two drugs in our pipeline. They're both in human trials. Our lead program is being developed for a particular form of brain cancer, a disease called glioblastoma. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. And then we also have a drug uh, working through human trials for ovarian cancer, a, a disease that uh, obviously affects a, a large number of women, particularly later in life. So those are the two main programs in our pipeline at the moment. And both of these are really exciting drugs that have really interesting histories behind them. Our brain cancer drug was originally developed by an American company called Genentech, one of the most successful biotech companies in history. It's now wholly owned by Roche, a Swiss pharmaceutical company. They, uh, they sell about $35 billion a year of cancer drugs. So they, they have a track record here that, uh, that, that most of us can only dream of. And, uh, and this drug, uh, promising though it is, didn't fit with their strategy. So we've been able to take it forward on their behalf. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Our ovarian cancer drug has come out of some Australian research in collaboration with Yale University in the US. And uh, again, has shown some really interesting results, which we'll talk about today. We are a publicly listed company. We're listed on the Australian Securities Exchange. The ticker is KZA. We're also listed on NASDAQ. So uh, we have about a third of our shareholders held there. Uh, a, sh a third of our shares are held there in the US by, uh, by the NASDAQ holders. And we're capitalized between about 30 and $35 million, depending on uh, which day of the week it is. So the first thing I should say is that we're a little bit different from most of the biotech companies you'll see here today, and indeed most of the biotech companies you'll see on the ASX, in that we're not tied to a particular in-house technology platform. We're not anchored to one particular piece of research. Uh, what we do instead is to go out and look for the best drugs we can find that for whatever reason aren't being done justice by their parent companies. Drugs that have been uh, either don't fit with their, with their parent company's strategy or perhaps the company's run out of money or it's focused elsewhere. And we look to find these undervalued opportunities, bring them into our company and to, to take them forward through human trials and then to partner them out to bigger pharma companies for commercialization. So we, we really look to own a, just a limited part of the drug development cycle. And as investors, you know full well that one of the challenges of investing in biotech is that to get a drug from, from the stage where it's doing work in rats and mice up to the stage where there's a commercial drug, that's typically a 12 to 15 year process. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars and it has on average about a 5% chance of success. So what we try to do as a company is to focus in just on the middle part of that where we really think we can, uh, we can add value. And that takes out a lot of the cost, a lot of the risk, and a lot of the time for investors. Ideally, we want to own a drug for sort of two to five years on average. A word about our team, we, we're a pretty lean organization. We, we really are very much in the, the mold of a virtual biotech. We don't have hundreds of staff. Uh, but we have a board of directors uh, who are extensively internationally experienced. Uh, our chairman has, uh, has been involved in a number of biotech companies. Our deputy chairman, uh, 36 years of Eli Lilly, one of the world's largest pharma companies. Uh, we have another non-exec who's an accountant. And my own background, as, as Chrissy noted, has been in uh, internationally in pharmaceutical and biotech companies. I've been responsible for the registration of over 30 pharmaceutical products in my career. We also have the benefit of a terrific scientific advisory board, uh, two of whom are in the United States, one in Australia and one in Singapore. Uh, and they really represent uh, some of the, the thought leadership right from early stage science through to clinical practice and, and are a terrific resource for a company like ours to be able to lean upon. 
quick snapshot of us financially. This is uh, sort of the most recent quarter, but uh, we're, uh, as I mentioned, we're capitalized at somewhere between about 30 and $35 million on, on average. Uh, as of our most recent financials, we had a little under $15 million in current assets comprising cash, accounts receivable, prepayments, and so on. Like many Australian biotechs, we benefit extensively from the R&D tax rebates, whereby the federal government gives us back uh, 43 and a half cents, up to 43 and a half cents on every dollar of R&D spend. And although we're a young company in our present form, we've been uh, really excited to get some, some uh, real recognition from, uh, from the media, from uh, the investment community over the course of the last year or so. And we sort of captured a, a few vignettes of that on this slide. Uh, I think uh, both the uniqueness of our business model and the quality of the drugs in development has, has really helped us to, to get some, some uh, really extraordinary engagement across the field. So I, I'm going to move now to talk a bit about our drugs. Having, having introduced the company, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we have two drugs in development. GDC84 is our brain cancer drug. That's the drug we're developing uh, for this uh, particular form of brain cancer, glioblastoma, the most common and the most aggressive form of brain cancer. And that is currently in what we call a phase two clinical trial. And the, um, the veteran biotech investors in the room will be familiar that classically drugs go through three phases of clinical development, phase one, phase two, phase three. Our drug is in phase two. We also have Cantrixil, our ovarian cancer drug, which is currently in phase one. So that's at an earlier stage, uh, but still, uh, still well into its human testing. And I'm going to talk about each of these in, in turn. So I'll move it first to Cantrixil, uh, partly because earlier this week we reported some, some very preliminary data around this drug, which I think has been quite interesting. But just to, to say a word or two about ovarian cancer, first of all, this is um, really one of the more common cancers, unfortunately, that, that affects women. It, it, it's the cause of death for about a, one in 100 women. It affects about a quarter of a million uh, patients a year worldwide. The disease is actually quite well treated in its initial stages. We have good drugs that work well for ovarian cancer. But the problem is that uh, it comes back. It, it becomes resistant to chemotherapy. And when it does, uh, it becomes a very, very difficult disease to treat. And unfortunately, that resistance, that recurrence, uh, is, has been uh, responsible for, for really a, a pretty dismal outlook, sad to say, for these patients. One of the reasons why we believe ovarian cancer comes back is, is a phenomenon known as cancer stem cells. And uh, when a tumor originates, it's composed of both uh, what we might call regular tumor cells, but also a small population of cancer stem cells that are very resistant to chemotherapy. When we administer the chemotherapy, we clear out most of the regular cells and we get a great response initially, but we leave behind these cancer stem cells because the chemotherapy doesn't really affect them. And those are then responsible for the recurrence of the tumor. And so our drug, the thing that we think is, is most exciting, is that it actually seems to work against these cancer stem cells. It seems to knock out all of the cells that are involved in the tumor. And, uh, and, and that potentially means that we can really help to reduce this problem of resistance and recurrence for cancer. So, uh, and this is work that was done in collaboration with Yale University, as I mentioned. It, it's certainly been exciting data that, that's been published in the, uh, in the scientific literature. So we've been running a phase one clinical trial. Now, phase one studies are always designed to look first and foremost at safety. These are studies really just to, to understand how much of the drug can we give to patients. And our study is really in two parts. Part A is looking entirely at the safety question, looking to see how much of the drug can be tolerated. And then part B is where we look to really see if we can start to get an answer of whether the drug works. Now, we reported early in the week some, some, some provisional data, some preliminary data from part A of the study. It is still ongoing, so it's still uh, too early, really, to draw any conclusions. 
But in the 10 patients we've enrolled to date, uh, we saw about five of those patients where we could really make a judgment on whether there was any sign of the drug working. And for three of them, the drug did ind indeed seem to be slowing the progression of their disease. It seemed to be res resulting in what we call stable disease, which is where the tumor doesn't really shrink, but it doesn't really get any better. Interestingly, in one of these patients, when we gave the drug with chemotherapy, the tumor actually shrank. So um, really, really early days and uh, very, very hard to draw any conclusions from a drug at this stage of its development, but some really, uh, some really interesting signals that our drug is doing something material for these patients. And in the background, I think some it really encouraging that it seems to be very safe and well tolerated in these patients. And we've been able to, to run the study because of that, actually, with quite a, quite a slim number of patients, which is always very encouraging. So, so the work goes on. The study continues. But I think we'll, uh, we'll see uh, a bit later this year uh, what, uh, what we get out of this further. But, uh, but I think certainly some, some really promising signals so far. So I'm going to move now to talk about our other drug, GDC84, as I said, being developed for brain cancer. And, and the particular form of brain cancer we're working on is the most common and the most aggressive form, glioblastoma. This is a disease that affects about 130,000 patients a year worldwide. It is one of the worst cancers, uh, unfortunately, around. It, it, without treatment, the uh, average survival is about three to four months. With best available care, that stretches out to about 12 to 15 months. Uh, but it's still a disease for which we, we've really had no new medical advances of any great significance in perhaps the last 12 or 15 years. So it's very much the definition of, a, of an unmet medical need. The main drug that is used to treat this disease is a drug called temozolomide, which is shown in the light blue box at the bottom of the slide. Temozolomide was made by Merck, uh, a big international pharmaceutical company. It's now off patent, so it's, it's not worth a lot of money for, Mer for Merck. But uh, in its heyday, it was a billion dollar a year drug, mostly on glioblastoma cells, which gives you an idea of the commercial opportunity. And temozolomide works well for these patients, but it only works for about one in three patients. And for the other two thirds of patients, it really offers essentially no clinical benefit. So we have the, really the terrible prospect here of a disease for which the, the mainstay of available treatment really only works for about a third of the patients. And it's the other two thirds that we're trying to target with GDC84. And, and this is really sort of a growing area in, or, or sort of a, an area that's receiving growing attention in the, in the, in the, in the popular, uh, in the media and in the, in the popular mindset. Uh, in the United States recently, Senator John McCain, the Republican senator from Arizona, has, has sadly been uh, afflicted by this condition. And that's really focused minds very much on, on glioblastoma and the need for new treatments. And, uh, and indeed, here in Australia, the, uh, the Cure Brain Cancer Foundation uh, has, has received quite a lot of support, particularly from Twiggy Forrest. And uh, uh, really, it's, it's very much an area of, of high focus, both for pharmaceutical companies uh, for clinicians and for, uh, for the not-for-profit sector. Now, our drug is, uh, is a member of a class of drugs called a PI3K inhibitor. And uh, at this stage in the morning, I won't bore everybody by talking too much about exactly what that means as in, in biochemical terms. But, but it's important to say that uh, other drugs have tried to work through this mechanism. And indeed, there are two approved drugs on the market that are PI3K inhibitors. Now, this, this is really, really encouraging because it means that we know that PI3K inhibitors can work as cancer drugs. This is validated, it's proven, it's tested, it's substantiated. This is not something that's completely blue sky and, and unknown. This is something that, that's been empirically proven. Now, the difference for our drug is that it gets into the brain. It crosses the so-called blood-brain barrier which neither of these approved drugs do, and indeed most cancer drugs really struggle to do. 
And obviously, when you're treating brain cancer, it's critical that your drug is able to cross the blood-brain barrier, get into the brain. And ours is the only PI3 CA inhibitor in active development, certainly that we know of, that does that. So, so we have a, a nice balance between a really well-validated, well-proven technology, but a unique feature of our drug that allows it to be used in these patients and, uh, and to offer something that other drugs can't. Now, I mentioned our drug is in phase two clinical studies. Uh, Genentech, our, our predecessors as, as stewards of this drug, conducted a phase one study. And, uh, and this study produced some really, uh, really promising results. It was run in 47 patients, mostly in the United, in the United States. The drug was really safe and well tolerated. Its main side effects are mouth ulcers and a bit of an increase in blood sugar. Uh, which for a cancer drug are, are, are generally pretty modest, uh, modest concerns. Uh, the study was done in, uh, in really advanced patients, and, and most of them received a very low dose because that's, that's how phase one studies tend to work. So again, it's difficult to draw very, very strong uh, conclusions around efficacy, but we saw <clears throat> some, some really good signals here. We saw about 40% of patients, it stopped their disease progressing. Uh, which, uh, again, in advanced brain cancer is, is really quite a remarkable feat. We saw about 20% of these patients remaining on study for three months or more. And to put that in context, these patients tend to progress in about four to six weeks. So, so it's delaying the, the progression of the disease and, as Christy alluded to, transforming it into more of a chronic disease than a, than a, a life-shortening one. And then in an experimental technique called FDG-PET, we saw that about a quarter of the patients, it shut down the, uh, the biological activity of the tumor, which again is a, a really uh, good predictor of um, how the drug behaves in the clinic. So, so the phase one study gives us some really uh, encouraging, supportive data to, to show that the drug is, is active. I think if we see this uh, now bear out in our phase two study, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be really uh, excited to, to get those results. <clears throat> and then finally, just to note that, uh, as I've said before, this is an area where there's a, a certain amount of work still ongoing. There's, there's two marketed products, but there's other companies also researching the PI3K space. And uh, none of these companies have a drug that is able to get into the brain as ours does. But those companies uh, have, as they've reported data from their programs, been, been well recognized by the stock market. And so I think we're, we're really uh, you know, encouraged that this is something that investors can, can very much ascribe value to. So I, I conclude there and uh, just, just say that, uh, as I say, both of these programs remain ongoing. They continue to deliver data throughout the course of particularly the next 12 months, we expect. Uh, quite impactful data readouts on both of these programs. So uh, we're really excited by the work we're doing and, and it's great to be able to share it with you today. Uh, we have a table down at the, uh, that end of the, uh, the hall and would uh, really love to discuss it further in the breaks and uh, throughout the day. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.